Well, good morning. Hope all of you are doing well. Have had a good week. Hope you're looking forward to rejoicing in the Lord this morning. We pray that the presence of the Holy Spirit is already here with us. Just to give you just a little bit of introduction and get us in a spirit of worship, our message today is entitled, A Song, An Earthquake, and a Jailer. I want to share just a moment about what Paul and Silas and others are going through in their travels so that we can relate. You know, a lot of times we, uh, I've told you this many times, we want to try to witness to those that are around us, yes, but sometimes we got to make some travel. So if you got that uh, map, Nick, Put it up there, and I'm going to try to use this technology. You cut them lights off a moment. Now, when we start our message here in just a little while, Paul and Silas are right in this area, right in here, Derby and Lystra. And they thought they were either going to go to Galatia and witness, or they were going to go over here in Ephesus. But it, the Scripture says that they were providentially hindered. That's just a big word for saying God wanted them somewhere else. You ever felt like that? You thought you were going exactly the direction that God had in store for you, but then all of a sudden he wanted you somewhere else. So they traveled up in this area. Sometimes when we read these scriptures, we think, well, well, they were just, they were just in a small area. They were just walking and going, and it didn't take them long to get there. No. Look, look where they went. They traveled all up through here looking for what God had in store for them. And right in this area right here, Paul got a message through a dream at night calling them over to Macedonia. Then they took a ship. They traveled for a day, and then they got on that little island right there, spent the night, then they traveled on over to Philippi. You say, well, Pastor, why in the world are you telling us all this? Well, sometimes we got to travel sometimes. Sometimes we got to get out of our comfort zone. Sometimes it's not about sitting in a pew in church. It's about what we do when we leave those doors. Where are we traveling to? Who's God putting on your mind and heart today that you need to reach out to, that you need to make a visit with, that you need to make a phone call? We can't just do it staying nicely tucked into our comfort zone. We've got to do more. And then one more picture I want to share of these guys in prison in case we don't get back to it. I want to tell you, they weren't just locked in the prison with three squares a day and playing basketball and watching TV and that kind of thing. No, these guys, Paul and Silas, were housed just like the worst criminals. Not only were they chained with their hands, look at their feet. They were put what they called in the stocks. How'd you like to sit beside your best friend or your worst enemy in the stocks like that? You can't get away from them. But that's where they were. And even in that situation, they felt a little song coming on, praying to our Lord. I want to read some scripture verses to you. If you want to look along with me, these are found in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. It says, This is the message from the one who is holy and true, and the one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. I know all the things you do, and I have opened the door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. He goes on to say, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. And then he says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God 
the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God, and I will also write on them a new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Now, when we read that right there, understand what he's saying to the churches, that's not from olden times. That's not just what he said 2,000 years ago. No, he's saying that to our church today. So I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you to forget about your troubles, forget about your concerns, your worries, problems that you have. You may wonder why sometimes we start our services this way. Well, it's for one reason and one reason only, that we will get into a spirit of worship that we will draw in accordance to what God has planned for us to receive today. Because guess what? If we don't draw into a spirit of worship, if we don't come here expecting to receive nothing, it won't happen, and we'll leave this place just like we came here. We won't be any more educated in the Bible, and we certainly won't be changed in our spirit life. So we must prepare ourselves. Are you prepared? If you are, raise our hands to our Lord. Father God, we love you as I've said millions of times, because you first loved us. We thank you for the examples of missionaries, great men like Paul and Silas, those that were thrown into prisons, those that were martyred because of their beliefs, those that traveled days, months, and even years that we, right here where we are today, could know that you died for us. Lord, what if they uh, took some time off? What if they had just said someone else will take care of it? Would we know you as Savior? Would our families be saved? Would our kids be grounded in the word of faith? Lord, help us not to take this for granted and help us to prepare ourselves today for your worship. It's not about us, Lord. It's all about you. We pray that each and everything that is done will be done in obedience to your will with the singing, the scripture, and the message. And Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to prick our hearts to be sitting in these pews right beside of us on our laps and in our hearts that we could feel your presence, that we would give our worship time to you. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people say it. Amen. God bless you. Dale King just commented that you don't need a microphone to hear me. <laughs> but you do for the CD, Dale. Okay. So what I'm going to do is let you pick a color. And even if you can't write your name, I want you to make something on this paper. This... Can you help me? Mark, can you choose a color? Bright? Okay. Y'all go ahead and put something on there. You can write your name. You can draw a picture. You can just make some marks on the paper. Whatever you want to do. It's going to be beautiful. Okay, good job, Brent. Is that mountains? It looks like the mountains. That's what it. You went to the mountains. I've been to the mountains. It's cool, isn't it? Okay, you can give me your crayon, Layla. You want to draw or make some marks on the paper for us? Yeah. Do y'all have friends? Do you have any friends? Do you have a friend? Yeah. What's their name? What's your friend's name? Debbie? Giggy? Oh, Giggy is your friend? That's great. You want to come put some, you want to put some marks on the paper, sweetheart? I cannot believe this is Summer and Taylor's little babies. They're babies. Good job. 
can I, you want to see if Gigi wants to do it? Gigi, you want to put a mark or your name on this paper? Gigi has grown up fast too. Okay, and then I'm going to put my name on the paper. What's my name? Tam Tam, that's right. Tam Tam, the lover of little chaps. Can I have that back? Okay. Now, when I was little like you, I had a best friend. Did you know I used to be little too? And my friend's name was Wayne. He was my very best friend. He was my cousin. And so we played at my grandma's and we went everywhere together because his mom and my mom were sisters and we did everything together and we had such good times. And do you know that Paul that we're going to learn about this morning, he had friends. Paul that wrote some things in the Bible. One of his friends was Silas. Um... We have lots of friends. And Paul tells us in Philippians that when he thinks of his friends, he thanks God for them. Every time he thinks of them. Who's your friend? I know one of your friends. Mm. What is that little girl's name that you married? What's her name? Nora. Nora. They had a ceremony at school and everything. But we all have friends, don't we? And Paul said, every time I think of my friends, I thank God for them. So we need to be thankful for our friends. This is magic tape, Aniston. It doesn't stick to stuff. It's called painter's tape. And you have that kind of tape. You got all kinds of tapes, don't you? What y'all have made... We're going to fold it over. Y'all help me make a birthday card for one of my friends. Do you know whose birthday it is? <gasps> Preacher Scott. I have the microphone. I want to tell y'all what God has done for me. I told Preacher Scott, I sent him a message one day. I said, I have to be able to to tell this to my church family. Most of you know that I've suffered with arthritis for a long time. And my worst, the first spot it ever showed up and the worst spot was this left knee. And one morning during my quiet time, I came across a verse in the Bible. And it's in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. And it says, rather than being dislocated, God can heal the hanging hands, and the feeble knees. And I claimed that verse that morning. I wrote it in my Bible. I am claiming this, July 15th. Well, a couple of weeks went by, and instead of getting better, I was worse. Um, Skip had to go get me a walker. I spent a week pretty much on the walker. I couldn't put any weight on my knee. But um, I went with my niece to take her two little girls to the doctor on a Wednesday. That morning I had come out here and, and played. I do a Facebook video of piano music and I asked the group that listens to me to pray for me because I was going to have to go to a surgeon and I had to decide, am I going to have surgery or not? So they prayed for me. That afternoon I, I went with Katie to take her little girls to the doctor and I was carrying the baby she doesn't even weigh 20 pounds, but it was all I could do to get from the car. Patrick, you know what I'm talking about. From the car to the building, and then you're just looking for somewhere to sit down. That was on Wednesday. Thursday morning, when I woke up, and any of you that know arthritis pain, you sit on the edge of the bed, and you just prepare yourself for that first step because it's going to hurt. And I stood up. And I had no pain in my left knee. I'm not talking it was better. Zero pain. None whatsoever. I have no explanation other than a miracle from the hand of God. It has been over two weeks. I have yet to have a pain in my left knee. And some people, I tell them, I, I mean, I've been telling strangers, I'm like, let me tell you what God has done for me. And some people celebrate with me and some people think I'm crazy and they're like, well, I hope 
that that's the case. But if God can part the Red Sea for Israelites to walk across on dry ground, he can take care of a knee. And I'm telling you, I have no pain in my knee whatsoever. And I, I just have to give praise to God for it. If, if it ever returns, it'll be because it's his will for my good and his glory. But I just had to share with y'all because y'all were my buddies. All right. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn with me to Acts chapter 16. I know our time is almost exhausted. We apologize. We messed up our song a little bit. I think it's because we felt like we needed to be in a hurry to move on, but it's God's time. And we will get through it. So I want to ask you this morning, how in the world is it possible, and let's, let's focus for a minute, how in the world is it possible to find redemption and healing from all the severe brokenness in our lives? Well, there's only one way that's possible, right? That's through Jesus Christ. Today we're going to kind of dig deep in just a few minutes in the well-known story written by the great apostle Dr. Luke and in the biblical book of, of Acts of the Apostles. And the word Acts in the Greek just refers to a collection of deeds or a collection of great and wonderful and miraculous deeds that we know were rendered because of Jesus' ability through these apostles. They could not do it by themselves. And because of Jesus' presence in their lives, they were able to do miracles. Now, let me just tell you, I hope that I'm not the only one that struggled with this whole idea of disciples and apostles. You know, well, what, what's a disciple and, and what's an apostle? Apostle. Well, a disciple is a, is a student, one that learns from a teacher about something that's, that's biblical. And through that, a disciple becomes a born-again believer. All right, so that's a disciple. Now, on the other hand, an apostle is a disciple, of course, a believer in Jesus Christ who is sent out to share the gospel with others, but they have three distinct qualifications. So here they are. Number one, an apostle, they had to be present during Jesus' ministry. Number two, they had to have personally witnessed Jesus after his resurrection. And number three, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to perform miracles and signs and wonders. So when you see a person living today proclaiming themselves as an apostle, I'm not talking against them, but they're not, okay? They were not here at the resurrection of Christ. They did not travel with him through the streets of dust watching him perform miracles. No, they are just like you and I. They are Christians. They are disciples, but not apostles. So I guess you could say that, that every person who believes in Jesus Christ as our Savior is a disciple, but not every disciple can possibly be an apostle. Okay, now that we've cleared that up, these stories of these apostles, the way that they were powerfully presented, the Word of God in every single chapter of this book of Acts is remarkable. There's no other way to explain it. It's completely remarkable because they were individuals as well as groups that they brought the gospel to with compassion and love, but with boldness and authority. Oh, that if we could possess that evangelical zeal that these apostles had. Many of you talked about our revival this week and the the peppiness of my, my friend, Pastor Cameron, and, and how he exemplified the presence of God in our lives, the way he brought the message. That one night he was playing with that microphone, you remember? <laughs> Just doing that. But, it, but he brought attention to, to what God's Word was bringing. And you say, well, he was very evangelical with his mission, with his, with his wording, with his proclamation of the gospel through the Scripture what we're all supposed to be. 
we're all supposed to be evangelizing, meaning bringing the gospel to someone else, not just resting on it here in God's house. So let's look together at Acts 16. And before we begin reading, I want to cover some background information before we just jump into this text. So as I showed you on the map earlier, we won't go back there, but Paul had just visited Derby and Lystra, and he found that young disciple named Timothy, and he knew he was brought up well because he knew about his mom and his grandmom and how they impressed upon him the importance of knowing Jesus. So Paul began to search Timothy out and wanted to use him in his ministry. As he began to use him and instruct him, and as Timothy learned what it meant to be a disciple called to minister to others, a missionary, what we would refer to it as, they went from town to town instructing believers and following the decisions made by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. And then it said in verse 5, so the churches were strengthened by their faith and grew larger every day. I wish that could be us. I wish every single Sunday our numbers would grow, the baptism waters would be full and flowing, but it says right here that's what was occurring. Next, Paul, as I told you through that story, through that dream, he was called to be hindered from where he thought he wanted to go, and God was instructing him to go to Macedonia. Now, you remember I had a, my good friend Chuck Register came here a couple of months ago, and he, he talked to us, and he had a message preaching about run to the cry. In other words, they were crying out in Macedonia that they needed to know about Jesus, and that's where Paul and Silas headed off to. Now, one thing I don't want you to, mi to miss right here, we're not going to put it up, but look down at verse 9. In your scriptures there, it says, That night Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And then here's where I want you to really focus for a minute. Verse 10, it says, So we decided to leave from Macedonia and have concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Who is we? Who's writing this? Luke. So now not only is it Paul, and not only is it Silas, but now it's Timothy and Luke, and they're traveling together to Macedonia. You don't always get that in the story, but don't miss that. They're all together because they're being begged to come to a different land to share the gospel. How many times have you felt begged of your ministry or maybe our church ministry to take it somewhere else? You know, all the people that need to know Christ are not going to visit here. So we got to take it to them. Sometimes that's in rough areas. But we got to do it. That is our calling. So we've got Paul and Silas. We've got Luke and Timothy traveling together. Real quickly, it says, On the Sabbath day they went a little way outside to the riverbank, and there they thought they would find some people praying. Now why in the world did they think they were going to find people praying by a riverbank? Well, I'll tell you why. Because at that moment, they were doing it a little bit secretively. And they were traveling there hoping, just hoping. I got to think that it was a, a ladies group out there beside the river. And they were praying together, talking about what God's doing in their lives. And they ran across this lady named Lydia. Now, this Lydia was probably a wealthy lady. It says, Lydia of Thyatira. She dealt in purple clothing. Purple may have been wool, may have been different things. I don't know. But she sold these. That was her job. But she was there with these ladies, and it said that she was a lady of God, and she was leading them. But when Paul and Silas and the others came to express the gospel of Christ, what happened? It says the Lord opened her heart, and she accepted the message and accepted Jesus. It already said she believed in God, but she had not made the connection from here to here. Because of these missionaries, she was able to accept Christ as her Savior. And it says that she uh, says if you... Was back, she was baptized, and it says she asked them to be her guest at her home, and she said, if you think I'm a true believer, then come to my home and see. Come and stay with me. Let, let me be 
uh, the hands and feet of Christ for you. And that gets us to verse 16. So just for a couple verses here, I'm going to ask you to stand in the reading, and then we'll try to go through them quickly because I know our time is short. Verse 16, And one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had the spirit and enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, so they grabbed Paul and Silas, dragged them before the authorities to the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they said. They shouted to the city officials, they are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods, and they were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. You may be seated. So let's go back to the question I just asked you as we began. How is it possible to find redemption, to find healing, to find encouragement? in all the things, the severe brokenness that we see in our lives, in our society, maybe in our workplace, maybe even in our homes. How do we find that? When we're fixing to see the story of Paul and Silas, and they were in prison for doing what they knew was right, for bringing the message of Christ. Would you and I be willing to go to prison for proclaiming the gospel? Look with me in verse 25. We already know that they were beaten, beaten. They were stripped of their clothing, and now they were locked, shackles around their wrist, and then in the stocks with their feet and legs and couldn't move. And then it says in verse 25, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Don't, don't miss that part. The other prisoners were listening. Now, let me tell you something about this prison. This is a Philippian prison. It's probably in the inner portion of town, but maybe out on the outskirts of the sea. And right beside this jail was a large 50,000-seat stadium where they had these atrocious games where men fought to the death. These gladiators that you would call them. And they were always screaming and hollering. And then you had this jail off to the side. You know what the jail was for? Because if they couldn't find anybody to fight the gladiators, we could sure take one of these prisoners that was going to be sentenced to death anyway and just put him out there for a show. And Paul and Silas were in this prison wondering what was going to happen to them. They didn't know. Do you think they knew when they began to sing what was going to occur? But it said they were singing hymns and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundation. And all the doors flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. And then it says, the jailer. Let's stop there for a minute. Let me tell you about the jailer. The jailer probably lived on the same site as the prison. He may have had a room upstairs or over beside, but this was his job. This was his calling. This was his career. His family most likely lived there with him. And you know what happened to jailers who allowed prisoners to escape? corporal punishment, most likely death. And maybe death not only for the jailer, but maybe even for his family. 
But then it says the jailer woke up. To see the prison doors open wide, he assumed that the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to what? He didn't draw his sword to go after the prisoners. He drew his sword upon himself. Can you imagine? Now, this is a jailer that might have been sitting there asleep. He might have dozed off. But then the earthquake, and by the way, the earthquake didn't just happen to be at the jail. I'm sure everybody all around felt the earthquake. It's not constrained to one little central point. But the jailer, he looks up, he sees the doors are open, he assumes that they're all running away, including Paul and Silas, he pulls his sword for himself, and look what happens. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights, and he ran to the dungeon, and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out, and he asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Just three points real quick. Three distinct things to point out that describes you and I to a T. Number one, there was greed in this story all around. But there was a saving gospel even in the midst of this greed. You know, the talking about the slave girl that we, that we read over when we started this in verse 16. Those men that were making money by this slave girl telling fortunes, they didn't care anything about her. What did they want? They wanted prestige and prosperous, and they wanted money. And when Paul finally got tired, even though the girl was telling the truth, even though she was walking beside him or behind him saying, hey, these men, these, these couple of men are from, from the Almighty God, and they're here to tell you how to get saved. Well, now these people have been watching this girl forever. They feel like she's probably demon-possessed, and now she's telling this about the men who did come there to tell them about Christ. But why do you think Paul wanted her quietened? Because you see, her story was mismatched. She was working for the demons, but yet she was telling the truth. Well, why not let her go on and tell the truth? Because you couldn't put any validity in anything she was saying. And you didn't want to draw attention to the men that have come to give the gospel. You know, accepting the gospel is a very private thing. It's something that's only between you and God. And when Paul immediately cast out this demon from her and it left, then her powers to provide funds for these men were no more. So their greed wanted Paul and Silas in jail. But what they didn't realize, Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, but they beat them like they were Jews. They locked them up like they were Jews, and they didn't say a word. It was all for the cause of Christ. The second thing is was there was guilt. So not only was there greed in the story, there was guilt in the story. Who had the most guilt? The jailer. The jailer probably knew that these men were of God anyway. He didn't want to see them shackled and put in jail to start with, much less down in the deepest part of the dungeon. And now all of a sudden, the earthquake came as they were singing. Can't you just imagine what he's feeling? He sees these men. They've been beaten. He don't know why in the world they would believe in a God that they couldn't see anyway. And now he sees them beaten, and now they're singing. And what time is it? Midnight. He said, these dudes are crazy. But you know what? They weren't crazy. Because as he turned that sword upon himself, Paul shouted, wait, we're all here. He's already seen three miracles. He's seen crazy men in stocks and chains singing. Then he's seen an earthquake and all the doors and all the chains fell off. You know, earthquakes don't make chains fall off of things all of a sudden. May make doors rattle, but they all flew open. He's seen that happen. And now 
He realizes from Paul's voice, which is down below him in a dungeon, Paul sees him. That's a miracle in itself. And he says, wait, don't do it. Man, how many times does God have to hit us in the center of the forehead to tell us what he's doing and what's going on? So he's seen them miracles, and finally he calls for some lights, and he runs around to see if they're all there, and he sees that they're there, and then he comes and says in verse 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let's look at verse 31. They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. Now, if anyone wanted to take this out of context and just read a verse at the time, your household cannot be saved because you are saved. Don't stop there. Read a little further, and it says, And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household, even in that hour of the night. The jailer cared for them, washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house, and he set a meal before them, and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Now, all this happened after midnight. We don't think about that. It was midnight when they were singing. The earthquake occurred. They screamed out to the jailer. The jailer wanted to be saved. They went to his household, had to be close. Then they witnessed to all the family all the family came to know Christ, but they didn't stop there. Well, we're going to go on back home. Uh, we're going to take these guys back to the jail. We'll have a baptism service in a few weeks. No, that's not what happened. They went out right then, and they got baptized, and then they came back and ate a nice, juicy ribeye. No, it doesn't say that. It says they came back and they broke bread together, whatever that was. And then they went back to the jail. Why would men that had been released from jail go back to jail? I'm not so sure that everyone in the jail didn't go back. That the jailer went back and closed the doors and everything was like it should have been. But when the daylight came the next morning, they realized that something had happened. Every prisoner in the jail was listening to the singing. So finally, the third thing, there's a glorious gospel, the same gospel that saved you and I, saved this man, saved his family, may have saved the prisoners. You see, the jailer was the prisoner, not Paul and Silas. He was a prison to his own Regard his own state, his own sinfulness, his own job. He was bound into it. He, he felt he couldn't do anything different. And when that was going to be taken away from him, then he wanted to leave as quick as possible. But yet, the Spirit relieved him of it. You know, Romans chapter 5 says that God showed his great love in sending his Son and even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In conclusion right here, there's two things that I want you to leave here remembering. There's two types of self-sacrifice. You listening? Two types of self-sacrifice. Number one is you give up and you give in to the circumstances. Now, I shared this on Friday morning in short devotion. Our circumstances should not define who we are. They're just circumstances. They're for a short period of time. But if you give up and you give in to the circumstances as the jailer wanted to do, trying to take his own life, that's the cowardly way out. And most definitely not the godly way. That's one way. We give up and we give in. Number two, the second way is we surrender. We surrender everything that we know to something greater than ourselves. We turn it over to him. On Wednesday night, Pastor Cameron talked of his life being put on a shelf. As a pastor and a minister of the gospel of Christ, he felt all of a sudden his church wasn't vibrant, his ministry wasn't vibrant. 
He walked around in a state of, of confusion, not knowing what he wanted to do and what God was even asking him to do. But you see, Jesus, just like Paul and Silas, emptied themselves completely to a God who could only know what needed to be accomplished. They turned loose of everything they had, and they had every right to know the order of things that they thought was occurring. If we read the story of Paul, we'll see that he was hindered by the Holy Spirit to go where he thought he should go. You ever felt that way? And once he got to where he thought God was sending him, then he ran into other problems and he found himself in jail. But he found himself in jail singing the praises of God, surrendering his life. The emptiness was now full with the Holy Spirit. They were empty of the glory of God, and it came in. They were empty of the humility of themselves, and God came in. In regards to witnessing and the challenge that, that Jesus gives us Christians in his word of the Great Commission, there's a book written by a man named Robert Milliquin, and it's entitled The Great Omission. And let me tell you what he says. He says, in a world in which nine out of ten people are lost, three out of four have never heard the way out, and one out of two cannot hear the church sleeps on. Then he says, could it be that we think that there must be some other way? Or perhaps we really don't care that much. Friends, Paul cared. Silas cared. Timothy cared. Luke cared. You and I should most definitely care. Sufferings and shortcomings are going to occur in life, and they allow us to realize the need for God to guide us, to refine us, to shape us. He doesn't give us all we need the moment that we walk that aisle and accept him. If he did, we would, like, we would all be like prodigal sons. We would take it and grasp it and just go do our own thing. We must search him out. We must be drawn to his word and in turn drawn to him. Don't complain about failures and hardships. We mature and learn from how we handle those. The tough times we gain wisdom and patience and fortitude and stamina and endurance and all those words that you can put in with that. Why do we gain those? Because we went through the tough trials, the tough spots. I think this is probably my son's favorite verse, Proverbs 18, verses 10 through 12. The name of the Lord is a strong fortress, a strong, strong tower. The godly run to him and are safe. The rich think of their wealth as a strong defense. They imagine it to be a high wall of safety. Haughtiness goes before destruction, and humility precedes honor. I want to ask you this morning, are you able to sing for Jesus in the midst of your worst distress? Are you able to allow it to be about him and not about you? Are you able this morning at 20 minutes past the hour to still focus on what God is doing in your life? Or maybe what you're not allowing God to do? It's not easy. Is it? It's not easy to, to share your utmost concerns for your fellow man that's going through sickness and shed a tear for them. It's not easy to, to bounce back when you've lost someone that you love. It's not easy to be turned down when you attempt to witness. None of those things are easy. But they make our skin a little thicker. And they make us realize what Jesus went through for us. Two ways that we can approach life. We can give in and give up and be cowards. We can dig in tight. We can give it to God. I'm going to ask you to stand.
I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes where you are for a moment. Maybe you've got someone on your heart that you need to pray about today, whether it's sickness, maybe they don't know Jesus as their Savior. Maybe you've got a, a song on your lips for them, a prayer in your heart for them. Maybe you've got a text to reach out to them or a phone call. But you're thinking about them right now. It's time to continue to reach out to them, continue to pray for them. Or maybe you're this person that you thought you had it figured out for years, but now you're doubting of whether you ever were really saved. Now I say that to say this, if God truly saved you, there's no reason to doubt that. That's the devil bringing that up. And you just push him away when he does that. But if you know that you know that you know that Jesus came in, then you can never find Jesus relinquishing your salvation. But if you're not there, that you know for sure it's time to get out of the shadows and make it real. It's time to ask Jesus to come in once and for all, and he will be there for eternity. Or maybe you're the one that's come here for a while and you haven't proclaimed your faith. You haven't joined the church. You haven't been used of God. Maybe you've been on a shelf or you've been too busy. I don't know. But I pray that God is working in your life, that you would be obedient to his calling. And even if you're in the shackles with the stocks on your feet, you can proclaim that my God is in control. And if he delivers me, great. But if he doesn't, then that's okay too. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you. We thank you for the day. We thank you for the message. We thank you for the men who in your strength, not theirs, were able to proceed on to share your gospel, to preach your word, to see lives saved. Lord, we pray today that you will work in the lives of all these that are here. The altar is open and you are there to meet them, dear God. We pray that you would just work right now as we sing your song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for being here. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today. We would just ask that you would help us be the men and women, boys and girls of Christ, that you'd have us to be when we leave this place, and that we wouldn't leave our challenges here, Lord. We'd take them with us, and we would be challenged to tell others about you each and every day. Lord, this is not the only, this is not the resting place. This is the refueling station. And we pray that today we are refueled to bust through these doors, go out to a lost and dying world to tell others about you. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.